and who King is an expert on, on the topic of LGBTQI aging and diversity. Although the scope of his work needs no introduction, I will provide a brief summary of his professional roles and contributions. Andrew King is the head of the Department of the Department and Professor of Sociology at the University of Surrey, co-director of the Center for Research on Aging and Generations, and the Center of Excellence on Aging. He's also co-chair of the Sex, Gender and Sexuality Research Group and member of the International Advisory Board of our research projects, Remember and Trace. He has received awards for his research and teaching and has published extensively in the areas of LGBTQI plus diversity and aging. Thank you, Andy, for being here with us, sharing your expertise. We are eager to hear from you, and the floor is yours. So I'm really pleased to join you this morning. I'm really sad not to be joining you in person. Thank you to Christina and all the TRACE team for their understanding of my current situation. Um, and I just hope you have a fabulous conference. I'm sure the program looks absolutely brilliant, so I'm sure it will be. Um, I don't really need to introduce myself um, very much because um, we've already had an introduction, so thank you very much for that. I'm going to um, talk a little bit, I shall skip the first bit about LGBT aging and me, very, um, and talk a little bit about, in a sense, the context in which I've been researching uh, over the last 17, 20 years, uh, which is around LGBTQ plus lives in England. I'll then talk a bit about something that I've been working on recently about reframing LGBTQ plus aging and queer generations. And then I'll talk a little bit about the sort of more practical things that have uh, that I've been involved with are very much engaging with communities and policy makers. So this is the bit I'm mostly going to skip, uh, but just to say that I identify as a cisgender gay man, although I will call myself queer in certain contexts, and I tend to use he, him, his uh, pronouns. And um, I've been researching LGBTQ plus aging for about 17 years. Um, although I'm based in England, Guildford is about 45 kilometers southwest of London, if you want to uh, sort of see where I am um, uh, sort of geographically, uh, but I've worked on many projects and collaborated with many people in other countries and geopolitical contexts. And a lot of the work that I've done, especially recently, is co-designed with LGBTQ plus communities and with practitioners uh, and aims to make changes in policy and practice. So just a little bit, if you like, about the context of LGBTQ plus lives in England, uh, where I mostly do my research, although, as I say, I've done comparative projects uh, as well. Um, I think it's fair to say there's been a huge amount of change in LGBTQ plus lives in England over the last 50 or 60 years uh, in terms of legal changes. And I've just listed some here, but that's by no means all of them. And we might say that um, the context, the legal context has shifted from one of criminalization to recognition and uh, protection under the law. Um, the reason there's a question mark there is because because things don't always work out that way. And of course, there's still a lot of discrimination, prejudice, uh, and um, illegal behavior around. Um, at the same time, there's been significant social and cultural changes. So if you look at surveys of social attitudes towards LGBTQ plus people, you'll see that again, there's been uh, there appears to be more of a trend toward acceptance and affirmation, and certainly uh, a, a greater deal of cultural vis visibility of queer lives in popular culture, uh, in the media, in politics. But there has also been or periods of backlash. Um, hate crimes are, are still a significant issue. Uh, and of course, recently we've seen culture wars um, being played out, particularly around gender identity and trans rights. So what I want to talk to you about now really is um, some 
work that I've been doing more recently uh, on reframing LGBTQ plus ageing, um, because I think it speaks to the issue of context and how um, we put um, or how people live their lives in context, but also we can explore context in different sorts of ways. Um, I was part of a project called Framing Aging, which was a network um, that was really sort of designed to bring geriatricians, gerontologists, humanities researchers, social scientists and practitioners together uh, from many different countries uh, and to undertake transdisciplinary collaboration. And the key aim of the network was to sort of liberate the field of ageing studies from the constraints of failure models of ageing, something that I've been interested in in my work for a long time. Um, the part, one thing that came out of that network was this lovely uh, book called Framing Ageing. And you can, um, if you scan the QR code there. It's an open access book, so you can access it and download the chapter that I co-wrote with one of my researchers, uh, Matthew Hall, where we wanted to look at the dynamism of LGBTQ plus aging, as well as its contextual positioning. And we drew on data uh, qualitative data from multiple uh, projects that I conducted in England over the last 15 uh, years or more. So being a sociologist, um, this, and uh, you know, the, the sort of opportunity to think about what framing might mean uh, was too good to pass up really with this um, project. And so um, I sort of started thinking about, well, what does framing mean? What does it mean to frame? And inevitably I was drawn back to Goffman's sort of classic text, frame analysis where Goffman talks about frames as schemes of interpretation that people use in everyday life to make sense of their lives and move through their lives in relation to uh, various organizations and institutions. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much of what I've already said you were able to um, catch, but basically I was in the process of writing a chapter for a book called Framing Aging, which led me to, uh, with my co-researcher Matthew Hall to look back over 15 years worth of data and think about what framing LGBTQ plus aging actually means. So to sort of do that conceptually, uh, we drew on Goffman's frame analysis, uh, but also uh, Butler's uh, writings uh, on um, frames of war. Uh, where Butler describes frames as discourses that shape interpretation. But in true Butlerian fashion, also the subversion of frames and getting beyond the frame. And so what framing essentially means is how everyday life is shaped by wo wider social forces, but it isn't determined by them. There's always agency that is framed within context, but that will be limited in some context less to frames, these schemes of interpretation, but also a theoretical analytical position that analyzes this to illustrate the dynamism of social life. So I'm rushing through this a bit because I'm aware we've got limited time. Um, when we're thinking about what frames LGBTQ plus aging, of course, we need to think about cis heteronormativity, those norms that are related to gender, gender identity and expression, and sexual orientation, and how they change in different contexts uh, and change over time. But of course, um, as I've written about in other work, we also need to think about intersectionality, the multiple identities uh, and forms of um, social division that we all experience and how they come into play in different contexts alongside gender, gender identity and sexual orientation and also, of course, age, ageing and ageism. So, 
In this um, chapter, we look at different types of reframing. Um, reframing the self, being reframed by others, and generational reframing. I'll just talk briefly um, about each one. In relation to reframing the self, uh, we drew on the um, interviews of two people in particular, Ernest and Maz. And Ernest talks about, uh, when asked, you know, how he felt about his uh, sexuality and getting older as a gay man. Uh, Ernest said, well, I'm gay, but I'm not typically gay and gave reasons for that. And later on, when asked about aging, said, well, I like I don't see myself as gay, I don't see myself as old. So in the context of the interview, which was about LGBTQ plus aging, Ernest is positioning himself, he's reframing himself in that context. Uh, he is taking part, but he's taking part on his own terms. Now, there's nothing potentially sort of surprising about that. Uh, we might link it back to the social and cultural and legal context in which Ernest uh, lived the earlier part of his life. Uh, and the need to be um, sort of more hidden or more circumspect about his um, sexuality. Maz, uh, on the other hand, highlights a kind of structural and systematic positioning in relation to her gender. So Maz came out as a lesbian in midlife and in her in interview, a point when, where there was talk about retirement, she said, I'd like to retire, but, and then gave a long list of reasons why she couldn't retire, but they were all related to her um, previous identity uh, and her gender in being in a heterosexual marriage and having children. So Maz's ability to reframe herself uh, is, is limited. Again, this isn't something that we would not expect to see or hear in interviews with older LGBTQ plus people. So we were also interested in how people uh, were reframed by others, uh, particularly how institutionalized others, so people who work in different institutions, might actually reframe older LGBTQ plus uh, people. And what we did here in the chapter is we divided this up in different ways. We looked at discriminatory reframings, but then positive reframings. Uh, we, in the discriminatory ones, we looked at actual experiences of being reframed by others and then experiencing dis discrimination. Um, but we also looked at examples where um, to avoid discrimination or prejudice, some of the older LGBTQ plus people we spoke to um, anticipated discrimination and they, they took steps to avoid being reframed by others as an older lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, uh, trans person. So there are two examples uh, that we give there, and I won't go through them in detail. Um, but again, it's things that you might expect to hear about how people experience discrimination in relation to health and social care, uh, and particularly um, hospital and care settings, which we know uh, older LGBTQ plus people have particular concerns about. But we also wanted to highlight how some of those institutionalized others, some people that work in those institutions, attempted to reframe uh, the situation to make a more positive um, experience, a less discriminatory experience for older LGBTQ plus people. So we heard stories about um, EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion events, about pride events, about LGBT history month events. 
So what we describe that as, as a kind of querying of the semiotics of context to make them more inclusive for uh, LGBTQ people as they got older. And the last example uh, that we drew on was um, generational um, reframing. So there is some limited scholarship on queer generations. And in one particular project, the Comparing Intersectional Life Course Inequalities in Four European Countries Amongst LGBTQI Plus People, um, we did what we call um, retro prospective interviews. So we talked to younger people about their lives and what they thought about aging. And we talked to older people about their experiences of aging and what their younger lives were like. And inevitably, we had um, people sort of talking in generational terms, but not in the Gener mainstream generational terms that, that you often see um, in the media and uh, things like baby boomers, millennials, Gen X, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I just thought I'd talk about two people here. First of all, Rahul, who described his ethnicity as um, Asian, uh, British Asian Indian. And he talked about how his generation were pioneers, as he put it, that um, they were, um, they challenged the more traditional and conservative notions of gender and sexuality of their parents, which would have uh, implications for younger generations of British Asians as they um, got older. Um, and live talked about contemporary discourses related to um, pronouns and, um, and how, as she says here, I've only become aware of pronouns in the last six months. Um, and then, you know, goes on to talk about how that, that's really, really good for her, that she wants to use, be able to use pronouns and ask about pronouns. This idea that there are these significant generational differences that can't be, if you like, refolded into one another uh, needs to be challenged. So we also extended this uh, work on queer generations. And I'm really not going to talk about this because there's limited time. But again, you can download this chapter uh, for free if you scan that QR code. But um, Matthew and I wrote about um, how ideas about generations um, need to um, scholarship about generations need to really take into account LGBTQ plus lives, but also, uh, and, and, you know, you won't be surprised to hear about this um, based on what other things that I've written, but we talked about the use of queer theory and how queer theory can help us to um, challenge those cis heteronormative ideas about generations and about reproductive futurity more generally. Uh, and in, in a sense, what we concluded is, like our participants, we want to um, talk about generations, but we need to do so queerly. We need to queer generations as a concept. So you might be thinking at this point, well, this is all very well, Andrew, and all very interesting sociolog sociologically, but what, um, you know, what about the real world? What about go what's going on in LGBTQ plus people's lives as they get older? Um, how can we do things that will make their experiences of later life um, more inclusive and better? And so... One of the things that I've been trying to do a lot over the last eight years is to actually change the context in which LGBTQ plus people um, live their lives, particularly in relation to housing, um, but also to create sort of intergenerational uh, dialogue in LGBTQ 
LGBTQ plus communities. So in a sense, there's been an, an, an intention to actually reframe uh, the context to create um, policy change and um, which will have a knock-on impact on people's lives. Uh, again, uh, you can um, scan those QR codes. Um, the Housing with Pride project is about social housing. Um, really, um, it's, it's been a long-term project. It's, it's to make social housing, that's housing provided by charities, uh, housing associations, local government, uh, more inclusive of LGBTQ plus people. Uh, and that now reaches about 2 million um, people in the UK who live in social housing. The Lifehouse project is a more recent project which has been using theatre uh, as a way to ensure that older LGBTQ plus people can tell their stories. And um, the idea about that is eventually to incorporate those stories uh, into an animation video, which can be used in uh, training for uh, housing and social care professionals. And then the intergenerational project uh, was a, a toolkit that we developed using um, generational, uh, creating generational uh, groups, enabling them to uh, draw these rivers of life uh, and then come together and talk about that in um, safe and a supportive space. Thank you.